Very good morning to you all. Welcome back to the Rural Aid Community Builders webinar series. Today we are talking all things social media and marketing. So if you're involved in marketing your community, perhaps you're a civic leader locally, or you have a business in a small town, and perhaps you've been quite affected by uh, COVID, uh, bushfires, floods, droughts, uh, we are going to be talking today all about how your digital presence can keep your business going during that time um, and how to tell your story. So just before we get started today, you'll see in the little chat section uh, that I put up some instructions. They're also on your screen. Hi, Di from Horsham. Great to see you back. Um, we encourage you to test the system uh, before we go live. In fact, hello, Peter from Brisbane. I love when people from Brizzy say it's cold. I bet it's not that cold. I really, I, our guest today is coming to us from the border of uh, New South Wales and Victoria. I reckon it's probably pretty cold there today. Um, I'm gonna just throw the little test up now so that you can all test your system. Hubert from Digger's Rest. You'll have to excuse my ignorance, Hubert. You, where is Digger's Rest? I love that, Peter. If it's below 20 degrees, it's cold in Brisbane. <laughs> what a great place to live. Hello, Vivian from Coonabarabran. Welcome to you all. We've got a great session today, super practical. Um, and because we're talking social media and we're talking about the social element of social media, we are encouraging you today to be super uh, active in this chat function. Give us anecdotes, send us questions. Uh, our wonderful guest today is really open to being thrown questions left, right and centre. Ask very specific questions if you need to about your own business, uh, about your own community. Uh, we're going to have a great day today. This is our eighth session that we've run for the Rural Aid Community Builders webinar series. The extraordinary team at bank of ideas you can see them there on the bottom of your screen are always here with us giving us a great sense of the themes um, and real world community examples um, of these initiatives working we've talked tourism we've talked leadership last week uh, we've talked uh, all about small businesses and making them great we've talked about telling your story uh, asset mapping in your community hello sandy from st kilda in melbourne hello to Oh, goodness, you, Emily from Camperdown, great to see you all joining. Actually, while you're all being so wonderfully chatty and welcoming this morning, I'm going to pop up on your screen now the Community Builders Facebook group. Um, that's actually where we're getting everyone to chat throughout the week. So we're putting heaps of great resources, a lot of them from Bank of Ideas up there. Um, we're getting people to give um, examples of what's working in their community, throw their problems out there, uh, and we're sharing a lot in that group. So we encourage you to join that uh, today. Before we do it, get underway, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet today, recognising traditional owners Australia-wide for their continuous connection to the land. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. If you are new to these webinars, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names coming through this morning, but if you are new, uh, a very big Rural Aid welcome to you. We're all about supporting small towns in rural and remote Australia. This is not about sort of, you know, big regional ideas. This is about small towns uh, and your own prosperity, your leadership, uh, the economic structures in your town. And of course, these webinars are free. We've been holding them uh, since the start of May now, and we've only got two left in this series, uh, but we have had such great feedback that it's looking likely we, we may go ahead and do this again in the future. I would like to thank our wonderful community partners in this endeavour, Bushels, if you've got a couple with you. Um, big thank you to Bushels for their support for this. And uh, if you feel like you're a, a bit, bit distracted taking notes, don't worry about it because we actually send you a full video recording of this about 45 minutes after the session. Plus we send you all the slides, a ton of resources. And if you're in that Facebook group, the Community Builders Facebook group, you will get a, um, a ton of information there. So we look forward to having you all join in that group. I'm just going to get rid of that featured action so we can get, uh, I can't get rid of it. That's okay. It's stuck on my screen. doesn't matter. Um, anyway, as per usual, we start each of our sessions um, with a sense of the broad themes that we've been working on in the Community Builders webinar series. Um, and we are so privileged to have uh, a brilliant man who's dialing in all the way, I think, from Geraldton today 
uh, in WA who has spent his career supporting over 2,000 small communities with their economic and community development. Uh, Peter Kenyon, tell us, what are we going to be talking about today? Good morning, Wendy, and good morning, everyone across um, rural Australia, and particularly those people who are coming um, from um, um, uh, coming from small town uh, Australia. It's great to actually be here. I thought we might just kick off with a little bit of humour about that small town stuff, and uh, um, I love this particular quote. The nice thing about living in a small town is that when you don't know what you're doing, someone else does. And I'm sure all of us who just love living in a small town can really identify with that particular quote. But I think the other quote that means a lot to me is simply this one, and it really has been um, one of the themes of this whole workshop, um, and, and that is simply this one here about uh, uh, the sun does not forget a village just because it's small. And I'm just absolutely inspired every day of my life as I discover what small town is uh, different small towns are actually doing. Um, last week we spoke, spoke a lot about volunteers and how they are the fabric that holds together many of our communities and again I love this particular slide from down in Albany in WA. Don't ever question the value of volunteers. Noah's Ark was built by volunteers, the Titanic was built by professionals and I just love that sense of humour and uh, that at one of their local volunteer gatherings I thought was just amazing. Um, as Lindsay said, we've been, this is webinar number eight, and really the theme is what makes a strong town. And really there are four very simple building blocks that we've reiterated. The leadership, that positive mindset, that stuff about building, you know, um, healthy community practices like collaboration and the way we engage people, um, inclusion, uh, and and finally, that set of kind of like strong economic development behaviours. And in just in terms of that latter one, can I just remind people, and particularly our new viewers, what do we mean by those type of behaviours? Well, you know, to me, there's probably eight critical behaviours that are important. These are four of them. And then then there is another uh, another uh, four. And I suppose it's the, the latter one that today we particularly want to try to focus on and ensures that they are digital ready. And today we have someone who's just amazing who's going to be able to help us kind of like work that particular one through. Um, People have also asked me, look, as a community builder within these small towns, what are the type of roles that I need to see myself doing? And, and therefore, what are some of the skills that I perhaps need to um, develop? And to me, I think there are five critical kind of like roles that we find ourselves in for which we need to skill ourselves up. How do we actually engage and mobilise and retain people's involvement and interest in, in their community? Absolutely vital. And that was why last week's webinar was just so important. How do we not just recruit volunteers, but above all, retain the volunteers and uh, their critical involvement? The whole area of asset mapping and connecting. How do we actually start not with what we haven't got, but what, how do we start by knowing what we have got? I believe passionately we never know what we need until we first know what we've got. So how do we engage in that? The whole area of just hosting learning conversations. We don't need more meetings. We need more conversations. I'm currently working in the Midwest um, with a whole series of Aboriginal communities, and they love this term yarning. And I think uh, yarning and, com and conversing is just so essential. That is what builds community. It's the oldest tool we have in the toolbox the whole area of network weaving. And then the final one, which is one that really relates to today. I think, look, if you want to be effective in community, it is about being a storyteller. People do not remember facts, figures, statistics, but tell people a great story and they never forget it. And so part of our role, part of our leadership role within our communities is, I think, capturing stories and sharing stories. And really, it's one of the critical challenges at the present time. Every town has a host of stories. And yet, I tend to find if you look at town entrance statements, if you have a look at the type of uh, preamble that often goes into uh, people's documents, it's about boring stuff. It's not about a story. And it just seems to me that the critical thing is we've got to kind of like tell the story. Every town has stories. And part of our role is how we actually capture it. I love to... Um, this particular quote, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. And, and today we've got someone who's particularly going to share that with us. 
I particularly, though, just want to just give you three or four quick little examples of one stories that have really impressed me about rural Australia. The first is actually that place called Marble Bar. It's my birthplace of all things up there in the Pilbara. And uh, I love that report in the West Australian that it's that stinking hot joint which always seems to get a crack on the weather report. It calls itself the hottest town in Australia. And believe it or not, there's a story to that. Back in 1933-34, the temperature went over 100 and went over 100 degrees for 165 consecutive days. And through that event, they can now call themselves the hottest town in Australia. And I just love the way that they've actually captured that story and allowed it, creating those selfie kind of like spots. I love the one where right in the Central Park, you can photograph yourself under the temperature of the day. I love that quote from the ironclad pub, kind of like outside 47, inside 26 degrees, be a two, your choice. You know, that humour that often goes with stories is just kind of like so important. Um, I am up here in the Midwest at the present time in one of my favourite little towns, a town called Yelgu, population 98 people. And again, I love the way that they have portrayed their stories in terms of their three entrances to the town. They have three influences. They have the Indigenous people's influence in that place. They have the pastoral um, community's influence and they have the mining community. And so they decided to mobilise members of those three communities to actually sit down and design the town entrance statements. And boy, have they done an effective job. It seems to me one of the best kind of like town entrances. You can see it from 10Ks out and boy, you just, every time I drive through there, people are photographing themselves at those entrances. Um, I love the fact that in our webinar number three, we talked about one business, the most awarded business in rural Australia from a tourism perspective. And what are they peddling? They're peddling a story, not a burnt out castle. It is the story behind it. And we, we were privileged to listen to Mark and Judy Evans as they told their amazing story of this place. But what makes it? is Jose Paranella, that, that passionate kind of like young Spaniard who decided to build a castle for the woman he was madly in love with. And that is what their whole business is about, a story, not kind of like the, the, uh, the burnt out castle. That's the backdrop to what an amazing story is actually all about. Now, can I um, just say that in closing, um, I've got one final story that I love to just share with you, and it, it related to an unfortunate episode of my life when um, I was uh, one of the speakers at a small town conference, and it was in a place called Bunbury in the southwest of WA. And all day we just talked interesting examples of what small town Australia was doing to reinvent themselves. But I'll never forget at the end of the day, we all gathered and we were knocking off some lovely uh, Margaret River red wine and a young journalist sidled up to me and uh, she sat down and said, listen, um, you know, I've sat here all day and all I've heard is positive stuff. She said, I'm a journalist. I work on, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, this is all too positive for me. Can't you tell me some negative things? I, I really want some negative stories. So I thought, hang on, I need to be a little bit careful of this young woman. But she was much smarter than me. She just sat there patiently for a couple of hours and just kept filling my glass and kept filling my glass and kept filling my glass. And as I slowly moved into oblivion and a state of drunkenness, it gave her a chance. And I can remember her peppering me. What do you think of these places? What do you think of Margaret River? What do you think of bailing up? Well, I spent many years of my life in bailing up. What a great town. I could still, despite my drunk state, say nice things. What do you think of Pemberton? What do you think of Northcliffe? And to all these communities, I could still find really positive things. But eventually she pressed the right button. She said, what do you think of Donnybrook? Well, I'm a bailing up boy. We were forced into council amalgamation with Donnybrook. We hate Donnybrook. And all I could remember saying is, listen, it would have to be the ugliest, most boring and laziest town in Australia. But look, don't write about Donnybrook. Write about bailing up. Write about Northcliffe. Write about all those other towns. But she persisted. And she said, why? And I said, well, look, you drive into the town and you don't get a second chance at first impressions. They've got their industrial area and their town entrance. Most of the, town, the main street is looking shabby. It is the so-called apple town. But really, what do you find? The, the only kind of like uh, link to the fact it is the apple town of God, WA is these plastic apples in the main streets, kind of like full of kind of like dead flies and whatever. 
And so I went on like this. But at the end of it, I said, listen, whatever you do, don't write about Donnybrook. Write about all those other great towns. Well, the next morning when I did get a phone call from one of the key leaders in the town whose opening words were not very polite, I suddenly realised that on the front page of the Southwest Times is me there, me, quoting Donnybrook, not just as the ugly town, but as the ugliest town in Australia. And boy, was he angry. He went off his face at the damage that I'd done. He was particularly upset that that weekend not much else was happening in Donnybrook and every news um, outlet had helicoptered in the town, including Channel 7, who did their their daily broadcast from the main street of Donnybrook. And what upset him was over 70% of the population agreed with me. They were ugly. And so he was furious. But not long after, I had the president of the Chamber of Commerce ring me. He said, Peter, we've got something we can play upon. We think that this is a marketing tool. She said, you know what? We are going to use this to reinvent ourselves, A, as a catalyst to get people together. And you've got to turn up and address a public meeting. Well, that was the last place I was thinking of going. But, you know, later that week, she was persistent, turned up, 400 people turned up, and boy, it was a wild meeting. But you know what? She skillfully turned the meeting away from what I said to say, you know what? In one way, Peter's right. We are so asset rich here but we don't portray it. We don't capture our stories. And now is the time to do it. And you have given us kind of like an opportunity. And so the starting point is we're going to play on the ugly tag. You know, it's going to be a temporary thing, but boy, are we going to do it? Because you know what? We've had more tourists turn up in the town in the last week than in the last year. People love the kind of like humour. And I love the fact that they started to have some fun and fun and humour's major part of it. They developed this thing about being the ugly town. And here this guy believes he's the ugliest man living in the ugliest town selling the ugliest burgers. They decided to print T-shirts. If you think I'm ugly, you should see Donnybrook. Well, that was okay, but then they printed a special edition. You think Donnybrook's ugly, you should see Peter Kenyon. Well, I thought that was getting a little bit out of control. But boy, they had fun. And boy, they started to do things. They used it as a catalyst. They started to look at that main street that I'd claimed people just accelerated through rather than stop and kind of like look at it. And boy, they started to push ahead and start to really make an impact. And you know what? Boy, did they mobilise support around that particular story. And the result is today that that particular town probably has the most attractive main street that we have in the southwest of WA. They have really played upon being the apple place. This is the place where the Granny Smith apple evolved in WA. They have got so much. This is the place where gold was first discovered in WA. That's another thing. This is the home of of Donnybrook Stone that all of our public buildings in Perth are built out of. And they started to kind of like build upon these amazing things and start to do things with it. One of the wonderful things that happened, they decided they needed something to stop traffic. And if it's not going to be the best toilet block, then the next thing that gets people stopping is playgrounds. And they have built around the Apple theme, the biggest free children's playground area in Australia. And boy, it's right in the centre of town. Is it a stopper? People stop there. People then wander into shops and boy, it has made a difference. And so this town over now, over well over a 20 year period, have implemented a whole pile of actions. And to me, it's just a great way people took a story, took something in their history and turned and had a bit of fun in terms of it. They also just happened to be one of those towns that showed the courage to kind of like create one of those wonderful uh, 323 community banks we have in Australia. Just another example of what this community of Donnybrook's been able to do. It certainly to me now is one of the gutsiest, one of the most can do communities I know. Boy, it is a community that really, uh, as I said, have taken their stories, not just the story of a drunk, but the stories of their gold connection, their apple connection, their Donnybrook stone connection, and so much else, and done some interesting things with it. So, Lindsay, there's just a couple of stories from small town Australia. Boy, we have some amazing stuff happening out there. We In sure June, Peter, what I love about uh, that story is the lesson that sometimes you need a third party to, to look at your town to tell you what others perceive of it, uh, but also be so careful when you're talking to journos. I'm a former rural journo myself. 
myself. Um, I love the setup we get from Bank of Ideas because it's uh, such a good look at the, the broader themes of every topic that we're bringing together and the focus topic um, of today, as we've mentioned, is social media and marketing. So before we put our guest on screen, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our guest. Our guest is a marketing strategist a social media extraordinaire who is one of those few social media brains that can really communicate with people in a way that is actionable and a way that has actual tangible benefits on your business. She's a coach and a mentor to savvy business owners. And in fact, she has been a small business owner all of her working life. She's the owner and founder today of a company called Social Media and Marketing Australia. I'm going to put up their uh, website in a little bit so you can reference her materials later. She has a passion for making small business simple because, yes, it's not easy. A lot of us know that. And I noticed that a lot of you wrote on the screen that you are from a small business background and you're here representing your small business. But she wants to simplify the marketing so that businesses can reach their goals and be more profitable. Uh, she's all about giving before asking and that's why she's the host of a very popular small business uh, podcast called Small Business Made Simple and I'll try and remember to put a link up to that uh, during this conversation today too because it's well worth listening to. Now you're most likely to know her though as the founder of the enormously successful Buy From A Bush Business Facebook group that has over a quarter of a million Australians supporting small business and rural retail. Her career started in law, which is quite interesting. She's a mum of three. Um, she has hobbies that include uh, killing plants, she tells me, half growing vegetable gardens and uh, researching the latest marketing trends. Please give our guest today a big warm rural aid welcome. It is Jen Donovan. Jen, welcome. Hello, Lindy. Wow, that was a really beautiful intro. Thank you. I'm really happy to be on here and I'm super excited to see the stats I'm looking at that, you know, so many people are here either, um, you know, for a community group or for their business, which is a perfect audience for what we're going to chat about today. Let's start with your story first to get that that um, handled so we get some context of your background. So I mentioned you started in law. Um, you've got this great business now where you support people. Tell us a bit about that, but also tell, tell us about that initiative you started back in October. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Lindsay. So I, I do live in the Riverina of New South Wales on the border of New South Wales and Victoria. So I'm rural born and bred. In fact, uh, I grew up on a farm, moved to town, vowed and declared I'd never marry a farmer and then proceeded to fall in love uh, with a farmer and now we live on a farm. Um, but I, I started in law, yes, and as the story goes, my best friend and I had way too much wine to drink one night and we decided we wanted to buy our own business. So we actually bought a retail shop and, you know, retail is hard, retail in a regional centre is harder, retail in a regional centre in the middle of a drought is absolutely, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure even why we did it. But it was, you know, where I kind of got my passion for social media and marketing 100%. Um, you know, I needed to grow the business. So I needed to learn this stuff. We had that business for about seven years to which we sold it and we sold it in three days. So that was super exciting for us. Uh, and I've been doing this ever since, just coaching and mentoring um, other small business owners, especially rural businesses. Um, I do a lot of traveling around anywhere between basically Bendigo and Griffith is kind of my jam, uh, you know, doing workshops, which of course I'm not doing at the moment, but lots and lots of webinars um, at the moment as well. So um, replacing that but it was probably it was the end of October last year and I was coming off a tour that I'd done so I'd been to Narandra, Leeton, uh, Griffith and Hay doing social media and marketing workshops and I was coming home from there and I was a little bit depressed to be honest I was driving in my car if anyone knows Hay shout out to anyone who's on here today from Hay, but there's not much between Hay and Moela where I live. Um, so, you know, lots of thinking time went on in the car and I, everyone was kind of sad. It was coming up to Christmas. Uh, the drought was really affecting small business owners. Um, buy from a bush was a bit of a hashtag that was going on, but no one kind of knew how to get involved with it or, you know, how it could help their business. And I kind of just had this thought on Friday driving home from Hay, if I started a Facebook group, then everyone could post their own things in there and maybe tap into a bigger audience. Um, so basically, I came home, said hello to my family, came up to my office, created this Facebook group 
through and sent it out to my friends and sent it out to my clients and all the people that I see in workshops and said, hey, join this group, you know, it might just help with some sales um, coming into Christmas, which, you know, it was about the 31st of October at that stage. And I um, pretty much, you know, I look back now and I used to post in there that were like, kind of like, wow, you know, 10,000 followers, awesome. 15,000, fantastic. And now it's kind of like 253,000 people. So it's just been a phenomenal growth in such a short period of time. Even though I started the group, it's been the community that has grown the group, which has just been amazing. I feel like my uh, me jumping back on it, distorting the order, audio a little bit. So I'll keep my question nice and brief. Thank you for that great introduction. You've got so many followers supporting those bush businesses, which tells me there's this real impetus in Australia to get behind um, rural people, rural organisations, people giving it a go. But there must be businesses in your group that do better than others. Can you determine from a social media perspective why some of them get better engagement or better sales than the others? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, yes, they do. And some of it comes down to product and customer experience, because obviously you can't buy necessarily on my platform. You have to point them to, um, you know, either Messenger to do it there or to a website. So some of it has to do with how a business operates. But I often find those people that tell a story about their product or, or give their audience a bit of a glimpse into why they started their business or why they're producing that particular product that they are producing or even importing it because you know I'd just like to say the distinction of my group is that you don't have to make the product yourself it's not an Australian made group I'm all for supporting you know those people that have the shops in Narandra those people who have the shops in you know Yarrawonga whatever they don't actually it's not a handmade group which I think is probably the distinction to make mm -hmm. um, it is the storytelling that has come down to people who tell the story about their product or about their business. You know, Peter is 100% on the mark with the storytelling that he was talking about earlier. And I guess I'd just like to, you know, extend on that a little bit. One of my favourite quotes about branding, but, it, you know, it comes into town branding as well is, you know, your brand is actually what people say about you when you're not in the room. So it's kind of, you know, what do people actually say about your town when you know they're out of your town are they the, your best lead source or your worst lead source so that's what it comes down to uh, as far as you know storytelling is just so powerful with that um that's actually a great <laughs> provided us there where people really need to work on the story behind what they're selling or even their story as a business owner and vivian in our um chat section just here has asked me to ask you how do businesses get profiled on your platform what tips could she share with local businesses particularly during this time at the moment where, um, you know, business has been severely impacted by the lockdown, the shutdown, um, but we're going to hopefully see a lot more people travelling to rural areas soon. What can they do online uh, to generate more interest in their business? Um, oh, goodness, that is, you know, that's a, a massive question, of course. Um, some of the things that they could do is, you know, showing a little bit about your story. I'm all, um, and, you know, probably by the time the hour's finished, you'll be sick of us telling you to tell your story. But I'm human to human marketing, H to H. I talk about it a lot in my coaching and in my mentoring with other small business owners because that's what it's about. You need to build that community of people who know, like and trust you and stop chasing um, the new customer. I guess that's one of the other mistakes that a lot of small business owners make is they're always chasing that new customer. It's like, well, what about the ones who have already bought from you? What about the customers who already know, like, and trust you? Uh, you know, what are you doing to get them to come back again, um, you know, one, two more times in the year? What are you doing to get them to perhaps spend 10% more when they are actually buying that cross-sell, that upsell? all those sorts of things. So that can also really help, you know, your bottom line. But it is about that, you know, what makes you unique? And, and you know, we talk about, you know, your USP in marketing speak, your unique selling proposition or your unique selling point. What is it about you that makes you stand out in your marketplace? Because I'm sure there are 100, 2,000, 
100,000 people who might do what you do. So what is it about you that makes you unique? And it's finding that element. And some of it could be simply by sharing the story that you have, why you went into business, why you do what you do, why is it important to you? I think that is just so powerful. There's a slide on there at the moment that talks about marketing is everything. And I think that is something we need to think about as well, especially in small towns. Everything you do and say says something about you, whether you meant it or not. And that comes back to those filthy apples. That was telling people something, whether they meant it to or not. You know, rubbish bins that are overflowing in your town, it says something about your town, whether you meant it to or not. And it's the same in business as well. I love um, just that mention there of like the the look the optics of something. We're we're so able to control our optics on social media to a certain extent. It is a two way conversation, but there's a post you a poll you've asked me to put up that I'm going to put up right now that I think is going to show us a bit of the accessibility versus the fear of social media. So it's so accessible to all of us, and almost anyone can get on and set up a a Facebook group or a Facebook page or a Twitter account or a TikTok account, I'm loving TikTok at the moment, um, and we can all set it up. But I work with a lot of small businesses too, Jen, and you and I both talked about this the other day, how many open it up and then just get <gasps> crippled by fear and think, I don't know what to post. And they go to post something, I think, I don't know, I don't know. And, and, and if they do post, it's often heavily advertising content style material. It's aggressively selling something. I'm getting people to answer your question now. How active would you say you are on social media? The majority are saying extremely. A couple are saying not very and um, we only ever post if there's an event or um, product. Can you walk us through um, your thinking around that? Thanks, everyone, for filling out this poll because it really does give me some insights to make this hour we're spending together a little bit more curtailed to what questions you might have. So lots of you are saying that you are extremely active on Facebook. Uh, oh, sorry, not Facebook. You're extremely active on social media, which I think is absolutely fantastic. But I want you and everybody else who's saying that they're not, uh, you know, extremely active to think about what it is that you're posting. So I'm not necessarily an advocate for posting, you know, absolutely every day, uh, but posting when you've got something that's valuable to say. There's a little thing that I call the three E's, which is the slide that's up at the moment. You know, I talk about the fact that you should be, it, when you're posting on social media, it needs to fall into one of these buckets. It needs to entertain your audience. It needs to engage them with some value or you need to be educating your audience if it doesn't fall into one of these three buckets then you really need to ask yourself three little words that I absolutely hate but love in business which are for what purpose for what purpose are you actually posting it and if you are posting seven days a week um, and you are putting a, a, a photo up with one word or one sentence or something like that, then it's not engaging your audience. You know, what is it? That, why is it that you're doing that? Is it because you think you need to post every day? I think your audience would much rather see you post something that's really valuable to them, something that entertains them, something that educates them, or again, something that's valuable to them than someone, you know, than just putting up random posts every single day. If you've never been to your insights, so if you're on Facebook or Instagram, uh, especially LinkedIn, don't give you such good insights these days, but your insights are your analytics. If you've never been in and had a look at them, have a look. See what your audience is engaging with the most and you know, start to think about your content that way. So, okay, so every time I put up, um, you know, a sale post, my engagement goes down. Okay, so I'm doing that seven days a week. Maybe I should stop doing that. Or every time I put up, you know, a funny meme, uh, you know, I get so much more interaction. Well, that's fantastic. But unless it's brand specific to you, I wouldn't necessarily do more of that. But it's looking at what your audience wants from you when they engage with you the most, what they engage with, and maybe starting to think about your content that way. Um, yeah, hi, Peter. <laughs> I don't think your mic's on, Peter. Oh, I don't think it's still on. I think you're still on mute, or is it me? How are we putting this humour in terms of communicating? 
the start of that question. I just wanted to ask you how important is humour in terms of uh, of communicating a story and, and use with people? Can you hear me? I think it's really important, but it also needs to be what your audience is expecting from you. Like I said, um, you know, I started my career in law, 15 years running a conveyancing firm and, you know, doing law. So the humour would be very, very different to what I'm doing now. The humour of a, a, you know, a town is very different uh, to, you know, the humour of your accounting business or, you know, of, you know, the local swimming club or something like that. So humour is seriously important, but also respecting the audience that you actually have and knowing, you know, what they would actually find humorous and, you know, what they would find engaging. And then on the flip side, something that you find, you know, showing a little bit of yourself through that humour. Uh, you know, some of us have a very unique sense of humour and showing that, you know, is can be part of our branding as well. So even though humour and certainly in storytelling can be serious, engaging nostalgia is another thing that people uh you know become seriously engaged with i do an email out to my list every week which you know is another part of marketing that we haven't kind of tapped into today but one of my most popular um emails where i got lots of people responding was when i was talking about the old melways if you're from mel uh, from melbourne but i'm pretty sure every capital city had these huge books of maps and that sort of thing and people were you know, loved the nostalgia of thinking about you know the old-fashioned malways and uh, ha everyone had a story about their malways so sometimes you know storytelling is just thinking about the nostalgia of how far your business has moved or or things that you used to do that you no longer do because of technology should i just look for a nod on you <laughs> um, there's a great question that's just come through from Chris. Actually, it's a comment, but I'm going to turn it into a question. It's about a community association um, that he's a part of that has a website and a Facebook page. And his comment is, it's a lot of work for volunteers to keep up with this, let alone, you know, managing both of them. Um, what is your, you, you mentioned earlier when you and I were talking that your whole business proposition is about making things simpler in business and in community organisations in terms of their marketing. What advice do you have to make it simple? And I mean, is it something you have to wake up every day and go, oh, we better post, what are we going to post today? We better find something to post about or is there a better way to do it? There, there are so many business owners out there who have the same problem. Um, so some of it is about strategically looking at that strategy, you know, spending maybe a day every six months and working out what we call content buckets or themes that you can actually run through your business or through your community group. So the content is kind of more or less set, or even if the content's not set, the topic is set. You know that in the month of, you know, if you're a show committee and your show's in October, you know that, you know, July is all about entries. Uh, July is all about creating that community interest. You know, September is all about the fact that you need to be talking about everything that's going to be at the local show. You know, January is, you know, maybe about, um, you know, memories of past shows and things like that. So getting those content buckets that makes your life a little bit simpler, but also scheduling. Now, there's probably as many arguments for or against with scheduling. People say, oh, you shouldn't schedule because, it, you know, you don't get as much engagement. The algorithm doesn't like it as much. But you know what the algorithm doesn't like more? Nothing. So if you're having trouble posting and keeping up, then, you know, you can schedule in Facebook itself. You don't need to have a third party scheduler as such. You can actually do it within native, within um, Facebook. If you need a third party scheduler, you know, something like Buffer, so B-U-F-F-E-R.com, like, you know, it's got a great little free platform to it. You know, maybe sitting down on a Sunday and scheduling two, three posts for the week, one post for the week, you know, one powerful post can be better than seven mediocre posts. So don't, you know, I guess, think of the stress of I need to post something, spend some time working out, you know, 
what are the themes you know within your organization what are the what are the content buckets that you can pull from and you know setting yourself up a little bit of a strategy so a you're not thinking about it at the last minute and b maybe looking at a scheduling tool I think that's great advice. The scheduling tools are such a time saver, but you, you're, that strategy day is crucial. The brainstorming day about what we'd like to talk about is really helpful. And whilst you've been talking in the chat, a couple of people talked about how nostalgia is really successful on their platform. Peter brought up how important humour is. And that reminded me that sometimes when I'm describing to businesses that are in, I'll call them unsexy industries, things that are difficult to make, you know, appropriate for social media I say to them the simplest thing way to think about it is would I say this at a barbecue and get a good response so if you went to a barbecue and you just were slamming out business cards and offering your services you'd probably not, not make a lot of friends that day but if you told them nostalgic stories and humorous stories and ask questions of people um, you'd probably get a get a better response rate there's something you said the other day that made me think of a barbecue too you said that there's nothing worse than people being on social media, posting a bunch of content, getting responses and not responding. Why is that so crucial? Ways, tips and tricks I had there for, you know, getting some more organic traffic. But yeah, if you're posting on social media and you're getting comments back or people are sending you a DM in Instagram, which is a direct message or sending you a message through Messenger and you're not responding, it's like going to a party and walking in and have someone saying, hey, Jen, and just turning the other way and walking. You know, it's just complete snobbery. If someone takes the time and effort and energy to engage with you, you have a social responsibility because remember, it's called social media. It's not called ignore you media. It's social media. So you have to become social on that platform. And I know that that's just a whole nother level of time constraints and things like that. So that's why it's so important to make sure that when you are posting, it's an engaging post, but you also have time to go back and chat to those people who are taking that time to comment to you. Um, so my little slide there was, you know, being about on the right platforms. I hear so often in when I'm talking to uh, business owners, I shouldn't say so often, I hear not infrequently from other small business owners, oh, I'm not on Instagram because I don't get it. Or, I, you know, I'm not on LinkedIn because I just don't get it. Well, it's just like, well, that's, that's not the point. You know, if your clients or your audience that you're trying to attract into come and buy tickets from your organization or you're trying to do business with, if they're on those platforms, then you have to be on those platforms as well. You have that responsibility as a business owner, as a community leader to learn those platforms a little bit by a little bit because you need to be where your audience is on social media. Having that reach out strategy, you know, it comes a little bit from, you know, commenting and that, but it's kind of that next level. You know, spend time on the platform, actually engaging with other people, actually, you know, commenting on other people's things, engaging with them. Um, you know, there's nothing better to grow your organic reach than, you know, actually having a reach out strategy and stop waiting for people to find you actually going out. And that can happen so easily in small towns where you can comment on other people's, like other community groups or other business owners or share their content and things like that create a community on social media, you know, be social on social media um, and being consistent. Like, But consistent doesn't mean every day. It just means being consistent with, uh, you know, how you turn up most certainly. If you... Um, if you are posting once a week, for instance, then post the same day every week. Don't leave it up to your audience to try and find you or trying to find your content. You know, if, if you've got something, if you post on Monday mornings, try to make it Monday mornings. Um, you know, if you're posting several times, it's not so important. But if you're only posting once or twice, it's, uh, yeah, it's important that you become consistent. And if you can do those three things, then you will actually see a bit of a spike in your social 
social media as you go up. I'm loving these stats that I'm seeing. Um, I'm not quite sure whether everyone else can see them, but it's telling me, you know, so 69% of you are on Facebook. That's perfect because Facebook, even though I have some gripes with Facebook and the way it's run and the platform it is, it's kind of like the 2020 white pages. If your business or your community organization isn't on Facebook, it sets off alarm bells to your audience. Why aren't they on Facebook? Twitter, that's interesting. Instagram, uh, LinkedIn uh, and TikTok, you know, TikTok's the new upcoming thing. For some people, it's the bright, shiny object and we need to make sure that um, we're, you know, what is what do they say? It's um, uh, opportunities disguised or something like that. No, that's not the way it went. I can't remember what the saying is now. But TikTok, um, yeah, not for everybody. Uh, a really good thing to go down rabbit holes. I could watch TikTok for hours on end, but not for my business. It's just funny. <laughs> yeah, just good relief, I find. I really enjoy it. Um, there was a, a left field question that I want to throw to you because I think it's really important. Comments, we, you've just discussed how to respond to them and why it's so important to be really personal and get on top of it and do it quickly. Um, what do you do if it's a negative comment? is probably you know realizing it's another human that has made that negative comment most certainly um, and sometimes all they want to hear is the word sorry and I learned very early on in my law career that there was a difference between I'm sorry for what has happened and I'm sorry that you feel that way. They are two very different sorries. So sometimes you can actually say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry this has happened to you, but you know, here's a solution or something like that. Um, so sometimes they just wanna be heard. Sometimes they need to be deleted. There's, you know, there's just no question about it. You know, this is your platform. They're on your platform. If they are degrading your brand, then sometimes it just needs to disappear. Sometimes, um, especially on Facebook, you can actually hide it from your wider audience so they can still see it and their friends can still see it. So they still feel like they've been heard, but nobody else can see it. So sometimes that is a good thing. But I would also say don't engage with them. So once you have made the decision to either delete or apologize that they feel they're feeling the way they're feeling and offer them a solution, after that, ignore you can you will never win against someone like that just like if they were in your physical store it's awfully hard to win against someone who has a complaint after you have apologized then if that's not what they're looking for then sometimes you know it, it, it just says more about them than what it says about you so make that just going to engage just engage the ones don't have a thread that is the worst possible thing you can do the, the one thing I'd add to that, and I totally agree with your approach to it, is um, there's a, there are people that are really vocal on social media and they complain about burning their toast for breakfast and then they complain about the weather being too sunny and they, you know, they, they're just really verbose and every thought they have is a post on social media. And they're often the people that um, complain, but sometimes there's, sometimes there's genuine human beings that complain. And I think the, the bit of advice I give business owners is, um, remember that your audience doesn't know the difference. They don't know whether the person's a nutter that, you know, posts 15 times a day and complains about everything or whether it's a genuine person that's um, not had a great service with your business or not received the product that they had purchased or, you know, not had a great time when they visited your town. And that your response is not only important to that one person, it's important to the 99% of people that don't post those sorts of comments but are just reading it. So the wording and the genuine um, empathy and the genuine apology are, are really important just for your own brand integrity. Um, I'm curious here because we've, I've kind of, we've kind of been throwing you so many questions throughout. Um, you've got a great um, slide here about the gap in the business. Do you want to describe that? Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the little exercises I would take you through if we were doing a webinar or something together. And it basically talks about, you know, your current state, where you are in your business at the moment or where you are, you know, in with your community group and the desired state. So what you actually want to achieve, what you actually want to do, you know, whether that be I want to, as a business owner, I want X amount of profit or as a community group, I want to run a really successful event. And in the middle, that's what we call the gap. 
And that's what we say. That's where the marketing lives. If you want to go from your current state to your desired state, that's where the marketing comes in. That's where the brand building comes in. That's where the building a community. You know, I talk about, you know, building a um, picket fence around the people who know, like, and trust you. That's where that gap is. And so, you know, without good marketing, without, you know, community and creating a community, then getting to this desired state may never happen. It may happen, but it could be a really slow burn. It's a bit like, you know, taking off um, and not having a map or not having your GPS and not knowing where you're going. You might make it eventually by talking to people along the way and asking for directions. But if you had a map or had your GPS, you'd do it a lot quicker. And it's the same with marketing. You might get there, but it'll be a slow burn or it mightn't be as successful when you do actually get there. So that gap is what I call um, the marketing as such. So, um, yeah, it's just a really good little graphic just to get people thinking about, you know, where they are and where they want to be and what does it look like in the middle that is going to help me get there. And, of course, for me, it's all about the marketing, whether that be online or offline. I guess, you know, between that social media and marketing 100%, but offline marketing can still actually be, you know, incredible successful if there are people on there out in the chat section at the moment that are saying they're actually not really active on social media with their community organizations or their businesses at all and and perhaps there is a, an element of well I don't really use it personally so it's um, beyond my scope where would you tell them um, to start <laughs> at the beginning is that too much of a, um, a broad answer um, I think one mistake that people can make and I do see it often is they get a young person to do their social media a young person to do it they think oh they're young they know social media and yes they probably do know social media but do they know your business do they know what it takes to run a business? Do they know your community group? So it's trying to find that person who can help you that is, you know, community minded, knows a little bit about either your business or your community group and, and perhaps is young as well. But look, I'm 45, so you don't have to be real, real young <laughs> to get social media. Um, but it just needs to be something that's a little bit passionate. But there are so many free resources out there. Like, you know, listen to podcasts, you know, if you go for walks in the morning, maybe put a, po a marketing podcast in your ears. Have a look on YouTube. Like most things that I have learned in my business, like how to, you know, do WordPress in the back of my website, how to set up a podcast, I've learned them from YouTube, just sitting down and giving myself that time. You know, um, th there's not much out there in the world that YouTube doesn't hasn't got a video to tell us what to do. I, Unfortunately, sometimes that's a bad thing because there is so much content out there, you get a little bit confused. But talk to other people. If you've got a person that lives in your town and they are quite successful at social media, ask them. I'm sure that they would absolutely be privileged to think that you think that highly of them. So have a chat to them. Offer them, to, you know, to take them out for a coffee. Can you just tell me a little bit about, you know, how you can, how I can help with my social media or what am I doing wrong? Or can you give me a bit of a, um, you know, uh, uh, some insights into you know what you could see that I could do better or at all but really none of us knew social media we all started and we all just learned as we went and you know I think about my podcast I'm up to episode 78 I cringe at the thought of someone listening to the it's the same with the social media. You'll cringe from what you did probably two years ago if you just give yourself that consistency to learn and just watch what other people are doing. Love that. I always think a healthy bit of plagiarism uh, masked as um, uh, appropriation is really good on social media. I know with my business, I just jump on and look at all the great businesses globally that kind of do what I do. And I think, oh, I like, I like that bit. I'll take a bit of that. I'll redo that in my brand colours and change the words a bit. Um, and that sort of content, it's such a vast universe out there for social media that it's very unlikely your two audiences are the same anyway. Alicia has a great question for you. Should a rural business set up a Facebook page or a group? What are the differences and what are the benefits of each? Do they serve a different purpose? 
That is a great question. A Facebook group, pretty much if you um, follow social media at all, I think it was back in January, I'm going to say 2018, I don't think it was 2019, 2018, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook came out and said, I'm all about community, I'm all about people connecting with other people, so I'm going to give more weight to groups. And so people's Facebook pages or business Facebook pages that were dying died a little bit more and Facebook groups took off. So if I take, I've got a Facebook group called Like-Minded Business Owners. So if I take that group versus my page, if I put a post up, exactly the same post, exactly the same graphic, put it on my business page, I get probably somewhere 12% of the people who like my page will see it over time. If I put it in my group, it's more like 69%. Sometimes it's 72%. Depending on what it is, it's even higher than that because the algorithm, which, you know, for those of you who aren't sure, is just basically a series of calculations and no one really knows how it works. But basically it means if people love it, you'll get more of it. So, you know, whether it's Google, whether it's algorithms, the more you you love the platforms, the more love the platform will actually show you back. And Facebook groups work really well for engagement. One, well, I guess if you can put a fence around your people and give them different content to what you would give them, um, you know, on a Facebook business page, then absolutely give groups a try. I think that, you know, for branding and getting your message out there, they are really powerful. I know this system by now. We're up to eight sessions and I'm still still not getting it right. Uh, I've got a final question for you. Um, I often, only because I often hear people say, oh, we're doing social really, really well, or others saying, I really don't know what I'm doing with social. When you objectively look at a social media um, presence, how do you discern and how should the owners or contributors discern that they're doing social media well or that there's room for improvement? simplistically, I'd say, look at your engagement, how many people are liking and commenting uh, on your uh, on your content that you're actually putting there, how many people are seeing it versus how many are commenting and how many are liking. So that's one good way. And also, you know, in small towns, I think some of it is, you know, listening to other people. Like I, so I'll be in the supermarket and someone will say, that thing you had on Facebook the other day, I absolutely, you know, thought that was the most hilarious thing I'd ever seen in my life. Or, you know, that inspiration, when you put that thing up and it was kind of like, you know, just do it, you know, get outside get in front of the camera stop being so shy blah 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 it was like man I walked outside and I did a video you know so some of it is actually engagement off the platform as well if you get that chance and often we do in small towns to interact with the people who are interacting with us on social um so some of it comes down to that but um having a look at you know what other people are doing that perhaps are in a similar market to you um and see what sort of you know content they're putting out but sometimes we are our best advocates so you know if we just need to look at what other people are doing and see if you know does that resonate with us yes no well maybe we need to change out what we're doing um i've got a little slide up there at the moment and it's just you know people often say you know what to post i don't know what to post so i've got this little free ebook if anyone's interested you know um i, I don't know there'll be <laughs> Uh, my email address or something like that I'll give a little bit later but it's just one of those little free resources that might really help with the content buckets that we were talking about earlier sorry Peter I've cut you off and uh, Jen just before we finish I need to ask you one quick question tell us one great story that came out of the bushfires where you know uh, obviously that devastated businesses particularly up in your um, neck of the woods up there in northeast Victoria southern New South Wales um, massive kind of like impact on businesses and people had to think outside the box have you got one great story of a business that actually reinvented themselves because of that kind of like impact of the bushfires one great story. Goodness me. Um, I have got so many great stories uh, that have come from 
both my community but also the buy from a bush business um stories everything from i didn't have a business to now i have a business so people who perhaps you know might have um you know just made candles for their mums and their best friends on their birthdays all of a sudden you know needed more income so they created you know put a few posts up on buy from a bush business created themselves a business i've had people reach out to me and talk about the sense of community that my buy from a bush business group has given them and you know now you know they they don't feel as lonely as they did they feel like they've got a community who understands them even if they're not selling something they feel like they've found a tribe i've had people um you know who have just sort of had to really pivot their business in what they actually do you know they've gone from you know selling a, a particular thing to completely changing it up and having to sell something else. Um, you know, a friend of mine has an accommodation business that obviously went down the gurgler, um, you know, with the bushfires and that sort of thing. So they diversified, um, you know, into more of an online presence and selling virtual accommodation or selling vouchers for the future, which worked really, really well for them. There was a business, a pizza making business, I believe, it was in Bright, which of course was devastated by fires, not so much in the township, but from a tourism point of view, because the fires were so close and they were shut off. Uh, so they, they couldn't open their business. So then they started, you know, bottling their unique sauce that they put on the pizza and put that online and started selling all, you know, selling the actual sauce that they sell and, set, you know, giving people the recipe to cook at home. They're, uh, yeah, they're the kind of stories that, you know, my inbox is always full of amazing stories. Some of them make me cry like a little tiny child and some of them make me cry with joy. But there is just, we live in an amazing country and we have really just lifted people up and supported people during these absolutely horrific times. For me, it was about drought and then, of course, bushfires and now COVID, um, you know, surely the sunshine is about to come out on so many small business owners. You're a bit of sunshine too for us in here, Jen, you've, that you've dedicated your life to small businesses and rural communities and that you travel around making sure people know what they need to know to succeed online, um, particularly in an environment where real world um, business and real world community tourism has been really knocked around this year. We want to thank you for the generosity of the knowledge you've shared today. Um, it's been a really special session and so much engagement. Um, for, and there's even comments coming through from Lisa now and others saying fantastic session. Thank you. Peter, I wonder if I can get your face on screen for a second because we've got a fantastic guest next week who I'm so excited to meet, but you know personally. Can you tell us a bit about Reese? Oh, your audio's Sorry. not on. Okay. Um, people will be amazed with uh, Reese next week, um, a young 31-year-old, an amazing kind of like person, passionate about regional Australia, um, a guy who walked out of school at 17, set up his own foundation to work in the whole area of mental health and young people, particularly in rural areas. Today at age 31, he is the mayor of the largest regional city in Western Australia, the city of Mandra, probably the youngest mayor we have across the country. Um, an amazing person who understands what it means to engage, particularly millennials, and uh, that's what we want him to talk about to uh, next week. How do we really begin to engage this powerful group within our communities? How do we attract them back into our community um, after they've kind of like left and gone to school? How do we get those homecomers coming back to our town? They are the issues we want to talk about. I think it's absolutely vital for the future of our rural communities that we engage this group and above all, attract them back into our communities. Reese has lots of practical ideas on how to do it. You will not be disappointed. I can't wait. As um, Shane Fitzsimmons said last week, that fallacy that the next generation don't want to step up is so easily debunked just by vacating a role and see what happens. Um, we are really looking forward to next week. We've had a great session today and um, there's some awesome materials on Jen's website and she's so accessible if you want to reach out to her. Um, I guess the last thing to say is on behalf of Bushels, um, Bank of Ideas and Rural Aid, have a fantastic Tuesday, Rural Australia, and we look forward to seeing you next well. week. Bye. Bye.